questions. So welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And welcome to the August 24th Hyperledger Financial Markets Mortgage Subgroup Meeting. Before we get started, I always like to express our appreciation to the Financial Markets Special Industry Group and the Hyperledger Foundation for making this meeting uh, possible and their ongoing support. As always, please note that this meeting is being recorded and is under the umbrella of the Hyperledger Foundation, so we ask that everyone abide by their antitrust policy, which we're sharing in the Code of Conduct. The antitrust policy states that we avoid discussions of company-specific products and pricing. We don't make negative remarks about other companies or their products, and the Code of Conduct means that we treat each other with respect, never discriminate, and communicate constructively. Um, we try to make this as an open forum as possible, and we fully support Hyperledger's policy of openness, equity, and inclusion. Okay, everyone is welcome at our meetings, and this is intended to be an open forum for sharing ideas uh, and having constructive discussion. Uh, this is just some of our uh, premier members, and we want to express our appreciation to them and the general members as well. And if you, you're you new, uh, feel free to introduce yourself in the comments, but lurking is welcome as well. And, and I know we were just talking about people lurking. I, I do that on a bunch of Hyperledger meetings as well. Here's our agenda for today. Uh, we've just gone through the introduction. Uh, we'll briefly go through some Hyperledger community information. Uh, James will discuss the status of blockchain in the mortgage industry. And then um, Mark D'Angelo and Rick Grant will discuss a beyond standards uh, discussion and we'll have a Q&A. So that's our agenda for today. I, I always try to share this um, slide at each meeting because this is to reinforce that we're all on the same blockchain journey where we just meet at different points along that path. This group is meant to help everyone on the blockchain journey and to demonstrate the feasibility of blockchain technology through mortgage industry use cases. We want to define potential and implementation paths for the mortgage industry, help companies implement or assess blockchain and whether it'd be good for them, and also to help uh, alleviate some of the problems and, and potholes that can, uh, that can uh, uh, slow down a blockchain implementation. Uh, so I can speak this morning. I think I need more coffee. So uh, there are several slides that I always try to burn through pretty quickly. The first one is this sitemap. This shows the different links and different information uh, that Linux and Hyperledger makes available. The second one from the bottom is the link to our Hyperledger wiki. We definitely recommend that you um, avail yourself of this. There's a bunch of information there, and James will go through that later on. Uh, in order to access this information, you'll need an LFID. Uh, this slide covers that, but I'm not going to go into detail on it. There is a pretty quick video, so it's easy to do. Uh, also, if you want to get a Hyperledger Fabric certification, uh, that's highly recommended. Uh, demonstrate your expertise. And then uh, I think last of all, this is a free uh, blockchain training that Hyperledger offers. This is how I got up to speed in blockchain. It's very good and I think gets, uh, makes blockchain very approachable. So if someone like me can understand blockchain, you can understand blockchain. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to James and he's gonna give us an overview of status of blockchain in the mortgage industry. Marvin, thank you very much. You know, if it weren't for the fact that we're 1,200 miles away, I'd offer you some coffee over here. I, I have my own cup. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, moving on to the first slide. So, you know, this month I wanted to bring you guys something a little bit different. You know, in the past, I've tried to bring you a variety of articles um, coming from different different source and through different medias. Um, this month, I actually focused on delivering uh, presentations to you guys that are video podcasts, audio podcasts, things that you can watch and listen to in your leisure time. So, you know, starting off with the first one on Web3 and crypto basics, this video is about 45 minutes long, and David Lycan of Lycan on Lending, the individual on the left there, he interviews David Levine of Liquid Hearts Club. 
David discusses his background developing online mortgage trading platforms in the late 90s to his current passion focusing on the intersection of real estate, finance, and blockchain. The Davids discuss the evolution of the web from Web 1 to Web 3, focusing on portals from the Web 1 ecosystem, platforms in Web 2, and protocols in Web 3. They also dis discuss the transformative power of decentralized finance apps and the revolutionary impact of blockchain technology on the mortgage industry. In this podcast, you can learn about the challenges and opportunities of decentralized systems, the importance of maintaining core values in the face of innovation, and how technology can enhance the industry in profound ways. It's a great overview if you're new to blockchain in the mortgage industry and looking to learn more about blockchain, tokenization, and smart contracts. Our second article, you know, we talk about Providence a lot. Uh, they are one of the leading companies in the industry out there that is making significant headway with blockchain. This is actually an audio podcast around 45 minutes long. It's hosted by Lex Sokolin. He interviews Anthony Moreau, the CEO of Providence Foundation. So as we've discussed before, Providence is a blockchain platform for real world assets and has a focus on financial services. Moreau explains how Providence is positioning itself as a control location of ownership and securities. He highlights the inefficiency and high costs associated with intermediated securities transactions and explains how Providence aims to provide a more efficient and secure alternative. Morrow also discusses the technology stack of Providence, which is built on the Cosmos network and explains the importance of purpose-built blockchain networks and financial services. He touches on the topics of non-custodial networks, ledgering, and the importance of network uptime and financial services. And finally, he discusses the future vision for Providence, including the tokenization of trillions of dollars of financial assets and the role of Providence in enabling asset issuers and service providers to transact, transact efficiently on a single platform. So if you want to catch up on what Providence is doing, again, about 47 minutes long. Um, it's an audio podcast. You can listen to it in the background while you're doing other things. Marvin, let's move into the next slide. So, you know, as part of our encouragement to continuing education in the blockchain arena, I'm not going to be able to do this one justice in the couple minutes that we're going to talk about it, as it is a five hour long video. Um, it's hosted by Rohit Sanawani. This tutorial guides you through the process of developing a decentralized app that makes mortgage processing secure, efficient, and transparent. It, it teaches how to leverage Ethereum blockchain smart contract functionality, Solidity language essentials, and Remix IDE for development. The tutorial also goes through the key concepts of blockchain technology, decentralized app architecture, and mortgage processing mechanisms to give you a comprehensive understanding of the subject. Rohit provides a step-by-step -step instruction walking through the code development and has an easy to understand style and presentation. As stated by the education ecosystem, this course is perfect for beginners and intermediate users alike. The tutorial doesn't just teach you to code, but how to create solutions. So um, I did get the opportunity to go through about the first hour and a half to two hours of it. It really was an educational video. I like the way that uh, Rohit presents, and I'm looking forward to getting a chance to actually finishing that up uh, this weekend. And then our last article to discuss. Um, so last month, we had David Coleman, the president of Mismo, as well as Devin Castor, who's Mismo's blockchain community of practice co-chair. They presented to for us in our July presentation. So if you guys missed the opportunity to catch that one, take a look on our wiki. We've got all of our recordings from our previous shows on there. But this is a great little series that Mismo is starting to kick up. They're less than 10 minutes long. This one was the first in their new series of Mismo's Blockchain Community of Practice podcasts. In the first Mismo short, 
uh, which was hosted by John Pomeransky. His guests included Sean Job of Credit Interlink, Harishi Kesh Godsey of USAA, and Devin Castor for CoreLogic was there as well. The topics that they covered is who and what is the blockchain community of project or practice in MISMO. The, they talk about the work group highlights about building the POC apps for uh, standards development, education, MISMO outlook, blockchain and mortgage industry. So a variety of different topics in a short little uh, presentation. One of the things I found most useful is they talk about their roadmap for the rest of 2024, going quarter over quarter. And to give you some of those highlights in Q3 here, they're continuing to produce additional MISMO shorts. And in Q4, I'm really looking forward to this. They're going to have a short demonstrating address verification prototype that they're developing as well as the publication of version one of MISMO's blockchain data set. So really interested in checking that out and hopefully by our January presentation, we'll be able to bring you guys some more information on uh, that blockchain data set as well. Um, lastly, they talk about if you're interested in getting involved, exactly how to you know take place, whether you're a member of MISMO or not a member of MISMO. Everybody's invited in order to check these out. Marvin, let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, this is our wiki for the mortgage industry subgroup. You'll see the link down there at the bottom and we'll drop one into the chat as well. You know, in the upper right hand corner, as Marvin indicated, you do need an LFID in order to get all the updates and notifications of future meetings. <clears throat> the LFID is free. You can click on the link in the upper right in order to uh, find out how to set that up. Over on the left hand side, we do have pages that contain all of the articles that we've presented in our previous uh, presentations, as well as some additional. We also have curated well over 350 articles now over the last couple of years relative to blockchain and AI. So if you're looking for some specific information and you're not finding it in any of our previous articles, feel free to reach out. Also, if you have ideas for topics or other things you'd like to see, we encourage you to send them our way. We're always looking for additional participation. And then lastly, you can access uh, um, previous recordings from all the way back to August of 2021, when we had our initial uh, kickoff presentation. Uh, Tanya dropped down in the chat the link to the mortgage industry subgroup, so feel free to click on that and save it for yourself as a favorite. Otherwise, you can see it there at the bottom of the screen, and it's available on the wiki and in our presentations. And Marvin, I think that's the last of my updates. Back over to you. Okay, thanks, James. That's interesting information, as always. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Mark D'Angelo. He's a noted author and speaker. Mark has been a featured author for the MBA, MISMO, and other organizations. He frequently consults on technology, innovation, and the mortgage industry. I've known Mark for quite a few years now, and every time I speak with him, I learn something new. I'd also like to introduce Rick Grant. Rick is a writer and marketing consultant. He's interviewed thousands of financial services executives, and his company, Content Beacon, delivers high-end content for mortgage lenders targeting realtors or loan originators, warehouse lenders tar targeting correspondents, uh, title underwriters seeking to reach title agents, and more. Their topic is beyond standard, and really been looking forward to this discussion. So, Mark. I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I always like to see everybody. Uh, Rick, you want to? Yeah, let me kick this off. First of all, right. gentlemen, thank you for what you do. Your shows are always interesting. They always teach me something I didn't know before. Now, when I was a reporter at National Boys News many, many years ago, the biggest part of my job was seeking out smart people who could help me make sense of what was going on in the news. And of all the sources that I worked with over the years, Mark D'Angelo is right at the top. The guy always has something about any new technology development that I wanted to talk about or write about, which is probably why he's written five books on the topic. 
uh, so far, and he's he's still working. So, Mark, I want to explain my role is mostly to stay out of your way, but I'm going to be watching the meeting chat because <clears throat> Mark tends to say things that go way over my head. And if that's true for you, you may want to ask a question in the chat, and then I'll watch it, and I'll jump in there and uh, and 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 stop Mark. That doesn't mean you can't pipe in and ask questions too. Of course you can. <clears throat> Sometimes it's just easier. Uh, for me to grab his reins than someone else. And Mark, I've looked at your slides. <clears throat> I know you've got enough material to keep us here all day. So I'm going to stop talking now. And I'm not going to talk again until you say something that I don't understand, which will probably happen pretty soon, folks. But but first, give us the lay of the land. Set the stage for us. Will do. Um, thank you, uh, I think. Uh, so one of the things that we always look at is, you know, again, blockchain has been one of those technologies, been around since the 1980s on an academic research paper, made more famous with the cryptos in 2008, 2009. And now the question is, you know, 15, 20 years almost later is where is it? Where are those killer use cases that everybody thought there were going to be and redesign the industry, not just this industry, but many industries. And so that's really what today's discussion is focusing on saying, something else is afoot and why are we often thought of blockchain as a single independent type of technology solution it more than likely in the future is going to have to be a building block that plays with many different types of solutions and, and we're going to look at a couple of those we'll look at some call to actions at the very end but we'll talk about this and that's really what this this whole process has been this whole idea came from uh, the last uh, hyperledger conversation with uh, david coleman David and I started a dialogue afterwards, and I said, you know, standards are great, but standards are standards. Uh, they're the lowest level foundation of data. Data is the new foundation. Where do we go? And that's really how this came to be. And, and kind of being the tongue-in-cheek guy that I am, I said, well, let's go from beyond standards to say, where's blockchain? So you're going to see a lot of where's Waldo throughout this process. And you see on the left there, if we're not talking about AI in this diagram, everybody's like, why? Why, why aren't you talking about AI? Well, AI is just one of the applications or component applications that we're going to deal with. So with that, um, we have a small audience. Let's uh, make this very dynamic and useful for everybody. So if you have a question, concern, uh, just ask. And we'll kind of pause for probably at the end of these eight or nine slides that have any value. Go ahead, if you would, Marvin. All right. These are the current use cases in across mortgage and, and, and finance. Most common, uh, the top five there, the past and the current uh, uh, solution there, the mortgage origination, underwriting, title management, loan servicing and payments, fraud prevention, risk management, regulatory compliance. Yeah, those those have been pretty much the last decade. Uh, and you begin to look at this and why did we do it? Transparency, auditability, security, and of course, making sure that the data was actually the data for the system of record. Uh, it's legal. Uh, but when you look at the future, you look at that crazy thing called AI and the question marks and all the solutions that are coming into the industry and everybody's saying, oh, you don't need an LOS, you need an LOS AI solution or you need a servicing AI solution or whatever that means. Those three bullets down in red at the very bottom are really talking about the fact that AI allows us to do things that disrupt the process. They disrupt the data flow. They disrupt the idea that data was within the application itself. And now we start to talk about these crazy things called large language modules and small language modules and smaller AI and all these other things that are hitting the industry. And it's creating a whole new industry called synthetic data. Uh, and, and how do you deal with adaptive immutability? What was once the solution may be something different. So that's kind of where we look at the use cases for Hyperledger moving forward. And what we're seeing is that, no, good, you're right. Go ahead, Marvin. Uh, what we're seeing is is this next slide, and this is one of the things I use with uh, students of all things. A few years back, uh, Case Western Reserve uh, University came to me and said, "Come teach for us." And I said, "No, uh, I am not a teacher. I am a practitioner." Uh, but we did agree on uh, providing an industry person to their students for one one class per semester. And one of the things I will be teaching again this fall is the idea of what does, how do you analyze a system? Where are the technologies? And one of the things I teach the students is actually very much this, this model approach. What are the methods? What are the opportunity? What's the design? Um, 
What are the events and, and how do we leverage that? And you'll see some key questions there that are often focused is what's the data architecture? What's the security, the integrity? How do you deal with data governance? Is it passive? Is it active? Is it on a domain basis? Is it an enterprise basis? What are the events? Um, AI is, is either event driven or not event driven. Depends how you train the crazy thing. And so how does this impact it? And then what are the, what are the inefficiencies? And I already see we have a question and, and Rick's doing the proverbial, I can always tell us, tell he's, he's stroking his beard saying, <laughs> Mark, I have a question. So, I'm confused, right? Yes, yes, go and, ahead. And this comes from James. So adaptive immutability, it's a new term. Make sure we're all on the same page with that. What does that mean? And you froze up on us for a second, but you'll be right back. Or it's possible that I froze up. I don't know. Are you I froze? Yeah, there you go, There you Mark. go. You're good now, Mark. Yeah, You're okay. good now. Uh, uh, you know, living in the country, what do you want? Um, so one of the things with adaptive immutability, it's a new concept that's coming out, especially when you look and you start to ring fence data, not just with uh, an analog. Yeah, one of the things with adaptive immutability is, is oftentimes we ring fence data. You know, large language modules have billions and billions of parameters. What's happening now on the more small language modules and, and AI that is kind of compartmentalized for an industry or a segment of the industry, like mortgage, is that that data itself is changing. We're learning more things. And so the idea of adaptive immutability is that what was once the system of record, we may actually find out that that is not the system of record. And so we have new data that replaces that. We have synthetic data that is built from different other systems of record. And so the idea of was that the real record? This is the same thing that why we created NISMO to begin with is what's the integrity of that information? Where did it come from? Can we vet it? Is it air free? So the immutability that we once thought, especially with the plethora of data that's coming in, creates this adaptability. So where was that in the chain? And so it's a concept that says, when I begin to train, am I training on the original? Am I training on the updated? Am I training on what? This is where some of this adaptive immutability comes in. And we'll see this on about slide 10, 11, really kind of come to bear and why that is such a key differentiator when we move forward. It's not changing the technology for immutability. What it's changing is saying, where what's that piece of information we're using? Because again, you know, blockchain was built on applications, application-centric mindset, really, they're silos. And if you look at that, then the question is, which one is immutable? Which one is actually at the system of record? This is where we start to get into this idea of saying, what we thought was once an absolute is probably a transitory type of approach. If that makes sense, hopefully. Yeah, no, that helps out a lot, Mark. Thank you. So if you look at the idea here, this is, again, just something, uh, you know, we call it model, but it's it's really focused on what we call data stacks. And we're going to talk more about this toward the very end here. Uh, if you want to learn more about this, you can look at uh, the uh, article I did for uh, for MBA Newslink uh, with David uh, Coleman uh, last month. Uh, and by the way, I'm actually entering my 21st year of writing independently for, for mortgage banking. Uh, for a computer scientist, that's kind of a, a strange thing, but uh, this is how we get to some of this. So this is where we start to look at blockchain a little bit differently, not as an end technology solution, but as a way to facilitate or begin to actually enable a more data centric approach to a more application centric approach. And Marvin, if you flip to the next slide, slide four, this is where you begin to see this comparison. And you see the QR code for the, for the David Coleman article there. But you begin to look at this. The traditional mindset for traditional application-centric thinking, that's where blockchain back in 2008, 10, really started to come to bear. We, you know, we, we really wanted to link this data. We wanted to make sure the data was, was indeed um, immutable. But was it immutable in the enterprise? Was it immutable for the industry? Was it immutable for a particular servicing origination system, underwriting, uh, ABM? What was it immutable for? And and then the question is, when we start to do all these crazy warehouses and lake, the replications, all this other idea of data governance, it was more focused on those very vertical type of silos. Now, if we take a 90 degree version, this is where it, it's funny, David Coleman and I had some interesting conversations this last month on, on kind of this, this modern data centric architecture. 
you know, MISMO has gone away from the idea of, of what I want to say, certifying a te uh, technology. Their, their whole mission now is going back to the original data. And that's what we call this kind of whole session is beyond the standards. The modern data centric architecture really talks about this idea of data as a product, different models, the monetization of that data, getting down to a concept that IBM talked about. Those of us that came from retail banking, remember Hogan systems? I don't know, Paul probably does. Uh, he remembers Hogan and, and this. Uh, but Hogan systems, it was um, back in the 90s. Did I lose you again? Oh, there you Back in the 90s, Hogan, IBM had come up with this idea of called data isolation modules. And this was actually some of the early genesis of data as a product, data centric. Why is this so different and why is this so important? Is the application centric thinking was great when we were doing on-premise or, or, or even some cloud solutions. But as we go to enterprise clouds and multiple layers of cloud, I got Snowflake, I've got uh, Microsoft, I've got Oracle, I've got uh, Amazon, of course. The idea of how do I cross the space to come, comes to bear. And you see on, just for example, data movement and the management, the idea of federated data. What does that mean? This is a concept that's made prevalent in the industry that you call data democracy. Where does it come from? Blockchain has a key component of that. Uh, domain ownership. See? And, and, and they're all very consistent. And then you kind of go down to that data quality and governance. These are terms that everybody loves to kick around. You pick up an airline magazine. Every executive is reading nowadays data governance. And you got Forrester reports. you got Gartner reports on this. But the idea is that you're beginning to understand how to manage data on a global enterprise, what they call MDM, Master Data Management. And that then starts to talk about these idea of what's a data mesh, which is all the data within a domain versus the fabric, which is taking all these domain threads and creating something that is cohesive across servicing, across different components of securitization, across customer contact. You're beginning to create that fabric regardless of the application. So what this diagram basically shows and how blockchain is going to be impacted by this hyperledger as an example is that we need to understand that the shift is happening and it's a permanent shift. And to do this permanent shift, this is where Hyperledger and, and, and blockchain in general can actually begin to scale in a proper way versus trying to say, I'm going to have one version to do everything. It's like, you know, one ring to rule them all. That's not necessarily going to be the case here. Uh, again, Amazon and their new, new type of situation. We've got more of the virtualization, the data lineage, which is very key, and this whole idea of self-service architecture. So you begin to see the adaptability, the scalability with Hyperledger has shifted from the original idea to traditional application. Uh, Mark, a quick question. I agree with everything that you just said, and I agree with everything that's on this matrix, but I want to focus in on the data integration and accessibility uh, row really quickly. I was on a call uh, a couple of weeks ago with a financial services client or a potential client that was still doing SFTP. And we were <laughs> talking about, and yeah, yeah, <laughs> we were talking about helping them uh, do some processing. And they said, yeah, uh, we have to set up this SFTP. And I, I had to stop him and go, you, you're using SFTP, like n not an API. That was their preferred method of exchanging data. I mean, guys, we're this is 2024. I mean, bring out the you know the stone tablets and chisels. Why don't you? So it, it's a much more complex problem, and, and I'm sure you know this, and you're trying to simplify it. But I mean, that just my jaw dropped on that call. That's why I'm trying to do the buildup. We'll get to kind of the solution again, kind of setting the stage for the chaos that we're experiencing, setting the stage, perhaps why blockchain hasn't found that killer app. Remember, McKinsey loves this. You know, McKinsey talks about this, Carney, BCG, all of them, uh, E&Y, my old uh, compatriots. Um, they all talk about this, but the problem is, how do you do this? And that's where this idea of bringing back a stack of solutions is the almost critical when you begin to look at a data approach versus an application approach. And we're going to talk more about this, but you're, you're, you're spot on, Marvin. I, I think that's the challenge is that our cultures are integrated. Think about it. Banking, mortgage, uh, even healthcare. Goodness, we, we were batch oriented. How long? 
30 years. Big iron, big IBM mainframes. Yep. I see Paul's got a question. No, I was just letting people know that uh, I, I I've run into this SFTP the 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 the, the batch thinking uh, and servicers are still glued to this. Yes, uh, and and uh, they, they they need to uh, really come forward. <laughs> and, and this is where we're going to talk a little bit about this, but again, this is a whole hours of discussion. Is event driven architectures, data architectures? Yeah, because event driven are time uh, dependent. So. And think about it. If I could create an AI that is event driven up to the current information, think about these agents that are being developed, these AI agents that everybody now is talking about. Um, what's the current information? I, I laugh at Amazon, leader in the industry, right? Amazon sends me the wrong product. I cannot get through their AI agent that says, you sent me the wrong product. Everything's a defect. I'm like, no, you sent me the wrong product. Well, have you returned to something you know? And they go down this. I'm like, you're not hearing me and I can't get out of it. So this is where the idea of event driven information could alter these types of interactions and the consumer would be much happier. For me, I'm like, uh, that I'm going to limit what I buy because you can't get me what I need. Go ahead. Let's go to the next one. Thanks, Mark. That was, that, that's good, 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 <laughs> uh, good color on the situation. Yeah, it's just a reality. Um, so again, now we talk, we kind of look at where we're coming, came from. We looked at the kind of the shifts of the industry. And again, you can tell I teach uh, college students, you know, a graduate and undergraduate. Now let's talk about why this is so important. And, and again, I call it the ABCs, not to be confused with ABC accounting, relational. What's the analysis? What are the building blocks? I think James or somebody used the idea of building blocks here a little while ago. Uh, and the causality, you know, what are the implications? And again, this is the idea, uh, been in the industry as a computer scientist 40 years, been in mortgage 25, equities before that. Um, but if you look at this, the idea of implications basically say it's a, it's what they call a modified, those of us that are enterprise ar architects, it's based in, in, in reality and theory. Zachman, who was another IBM fellow uh, from the 1970s, wrote Enterprise Architecture, um, Tapscott and all these authors quote him. But he always said, what are the principles you are trying to adhere to as an industry? So it's a very good statement. It's business driven. It understands what you're trying to do. And then he said, what's the rationale? And, and often in blockchain and hyperledger, we, we, we talk about the rationale. Oh, it's great. It does this. It saves this. It, it creates immutability. Super. We understand the building blocks. We understand the rationale. But we don't understand saying if we adhere to the principles, we adhere to the rationale. What comes in the middle? What have, What do I have to do to make this happen? Is that a cultural thing? Is that a system thing? Oftentimes we focus on tech, but or is it a organizational dynamic, an organizational change issue? This is the causality that oftentimes that if we were to apply blockchain hyperledger to, I think it would get far more traction, especially as we see slide nine here. So the ABC of transformations, data is a seismic shift. You know, we are now at uh, 300 times 10 to the 23 data generating every year. Do that from a number of zeros onto that. It's it's just going up uh, on an exponential curve with nonstop. How do you begin to bring all this together? And that's the the, the almost the mind numbing aspect of data centric designs. That's also I think why hyperledger and blockchain have failed because you cannot keep up with an exponential curve with the technology and saying it's going to be one thing for everything doesn't necessarily work. Go to the next slide if you would. We don't have any other questions here, Marvin. So again, projecting this forward, the rationale. Um, again, this, this kind of leads into slide 10, which is kind of the call to action, slide 11. Um, how are we going to do this? How do we divide this crazy blob into something that's workable? How do we actually get traction? That's the call to action. How do we deal with process over data? You know, think about it. Mortgage industry, right? We are always focused on automating paper-based processes. How many people still run, not just to uh, SMTP and all this other stuff, but how many people run into uh, scraping screens or still doing Acrobat files or exchanging information? Why are we doing this? Again, the idea that these were locked into process, but actually when we look at data and we look at the ability to apply Hyperledger and, and blockchain in different ways, we destroy the process. 
And so rather than automate processes, which is where the industry has been focused on from MISMO and standards for the last 25 years and the last 15 years, FinTech, RegTech, all these things are beginning to transform. And that's where the idea of data over process is so key. And so again, we'll, we're kind of this ability to failure to scale. We always think one size fits all. Yeah, it did when we were we had this much data, right? And we controlled the data. Today, mortgage industry and financial systems control about 40% of the customer data. The rest of it comes from outside. How do you bring all that together? And it's getting worse. So it's a declining curve. It's like uh, Fannie and Freddie before the Great Recession. You know, they had all this volume. You know, they had about 35, 38% of all mortgages. And then it went crazy and every, they had the whole market. But we had all these other players. And I think that's where we are today. We're not looking at something that's going to blow it up and say, everything's going to go back centralized. That is far from the case. Everything is truly de decentralized today. And that's where this ability to scale is so critical. Nick, I don't, uh, Rick, I don't see you stroking your beard, so I guess we're good. Well, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to understand what the implications of this is, like who are going to be the cloud players in the future. But I want to let you continue because I think you're going to take us there, and and I want to give you the space well, to if, do it. If not, you can bring me back. Um, <laughs> go ahead, Marvin. Next one. And so again, kind of the the how do we how do we transform this? And one of the things I, I tell clients, I tell uh, students that I'm teaching. You need to ask uh, the who, what, where, why, how. Uh, and if you can answer those, and these are just some representative questions, um, then you can begin to address this uh, data idea. What's on the right there is figure two is a diagram I published at uh, Thomson Reuters uh, as part of my, my monthly column with Reuters nowadays um, and the QR codes at the bottom. But what this came from, and you can see all the different industries, this is not necessarily mortgage specific. This came from my discussions with the national auditing firms, KPMG, Ernst & Young, uh, Deloitte & Touche, uh, BDO Seidman, yada, yada, yada. And I went on and spoke to a private event with them, um, goodness, uh, a year ago. And so a lot of this started coming from them because what we started to do with these tax and audit folks and the AI, and we were talking about two-day event. We had brought some great, great minds in. You know, my question to him was, well, that's great. AI is super. It's going to, you know, improve your efficiencies. And my, my, you know, being the smart Alec ball headed guy, I kind of said, how are you going to audit? it? How are you going to audit AI? Because it's kind of like a black box. It's got all these parameters. Parameters are changing. What if the algorithms change? What happens when I cascade AI from AI system to AI system and the data goes 20 levels down? I said, how do you audit that? And that's where the light bulb kind of came on. They're like, oh. Uh, and, and that's what this diagram really starts to talk about, which again, will lead into kind of the final solution here on the slide, is when you start to apply the, the, native, the latest and greatest hype, which is AI, gen AI, neural networks, ML, whatever, whatever form and fashion you want to deal with this, this is where these use cases of AI really came to be and how data became such a key component. And if we are business people, if we are investing in this, what are we going to invest in? What are the capital budgets that we're going to do? Are we going to do this cloud? Are we going to do it on premise? Are we going to develop our own? Are we going to partner with a different organization? That's where I started saying, okay, when considering all the new technologies, and again, having 15 years of hyperledger, 18 years, whatever it's been, of this whole blockchain mindset is, how is this all going to be put together? How are you going to create a data stack that adapts to an environment that is already in, in high growth? It's no longer measured in, in years of an application capability. It's months and weeks. Uh, that's a different mindset. That's a different for organizational people to figure out what's the internal rate of return? What's the uh, ROIs? What's, how are we going to invest? What are this? What are the skills? It sounds I'm on the, um, my internet's kind of goofing up. Am I okay? Yeah, we got you. It's a little, yeah. little okay. glitchy, but we got you. Okay. Yeah, it, it says it came in a little glitchy, but that's kind of where these questions would be. Is so if you're going to innovate with a modern data architecture from this hyperledger, from the application, from the mortgage world, how do you put all these pieces together? And that's really what that diagram was with the questions asked. Now, a uh, question mark, um, because you're talking about uh, several things that are kind of working at cross purposes. And I really like this diagram 
because you have legal and compliance functions uh, on the right hand side. And if you go back to how the entire mortgage process from origination to secondary markets has developed within the past five, 10 years, a lot of that change has been driven by legal and compliance needs. A, a lot of the rigor, a lot of the slowing down of the processing has been due to meeting legal and compliance requirements. So how do those requirements get met while still taking advantage of what blockchain and AI can do? Because they work at cross purposes. And just, uh, I've been taking a look at the securitization process and there's a, at least half a dozen due diligence steps that take place in the securitization of a mortgage of a mortgage to make it a, a mortgage backed security. Um, conceivably, you can eliminate the majority, if not all of those due, di due diligence functions, but then are you still meeting the regulatory and legal requirements? And I know Paul definitely has something to add to this too. So um, I, that's the question that I pose to you guys. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But for first, I'd like to hear him answer your answer what you had, what you asked, and then, then I do have more. <laughs> the, the challenge is, and again, I deal with uh, the Reuters legal and some of the Bloomberg legal folks as well. And what you're beginning to see is this idea of it used to be a very serialized process, right? So when we did this, it was step one, two, three. With the ability of AI, modern workflows, the data that's available, what's happening is now we're running these things in parallel. And so the idea is, how do we begin to group these things together? And what's happening is, as they create these parallel processes, you know, we're, we're kind of automating the steps, like you're saying, securitization. Maybe there are six different regulations we have to have. What's, what's going on is that they're building a common platform. And we'll see this actually on slide nine. Well, they're building a common integration fabric that brings all this together. And then it's a heck of a lot easier to say, well, I, I don't, I only need this one this one, and I need this one. So so maybe I need three of the four that were there because I'm rewriting the process. And oftentimes it's the legal kind of leading into the regulatory that are saying, oh, that is creating multiple data stacks, different streams, different uh, delays that we no longer need. So they're actually becoming the change agents, if you will, for much of the data and how it's used because it used to be we're going to automate and improve a process to get it quicker. They're saying, is that even relevant? And, and so that's where the idea of having, um, and that's why you see the top sections of this diagram kind of in gray, but you'll see the legal compliance tax and accounting coming in at full force. They have changed their agenda, their focus, and they are now kind of almost the primary customers for this data because if they're not on board, then all we still have is a bunch of silos. They're looking at it from an enterprise level and saying, how do I begin to automate all of this with a complete audit trail, a look back, and I can satisfy regulatory demands. And by the way, I have one version of the truth. Well, that's so, so that's the, where it's going. Yeah, that I well, Mark, you that you nailed that. That does that's exactly what I was going to ask. You know, one version of the truth. Uh, how does how does that? I have a feeling you're going to say slide nine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> slide nine, Paul. Slide nine. <laughs> I have a feeling you're going to say slide nine. But uh, I, I'm just wondering, you know, how, how adaptive immutability um, uh, helps or hinders that process. I think it, it definitely helps because what's happening is you're beginning to retire information that is no longer valid. Just like we used to do with archivals and, and purging of different databases once upon a time when they were application centric. What happens over time is those numbers begin to go. So maybe we had a great big pot. And that was our, our base of information. But now as we begin to apply these different technologies, complete data uh, centric approach, that, that sphere becomes much smaller in nature. And so the adaptive immutability actually says, all that stuff was great. It worked at the time based upon the business rules, the knowledge we had, but that is shrinking. So the integrity, the reusability of that information, the validity of that information begins to shrink. And that's well, what that, they're yeah. driving for. Okay, I'm 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 dying for slide nine. I gotta tell you. <laughs> so go that, ahead. That, that that does answer my question. I think uh, I, I if 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 I need to get more in the weeds, I'll I'll, I'll let you know. All right.
So go ahead. So then the question is, you know, again, where where's the where's the Waldo? Where's the AI, which everybody always wants to hear about? Now let's get into kind of the next ones. And this is actually a, a diagram, and it's not for the faint of heart, but this is the QR codes there. This is one of all things that uh, uh, David Coleman, when I first gave it to him, I, I thought I would get kind of the glazed eyes. Uh, you know, David's background as a consultant, he says, he says, man, this is this is very eerie to what I've, I'm thinking. And, and so we've kind of got to this process. And what you see here is this idea of data centric layers, data stacks, as I kind of term them. And, and this is a different mindset. So if you see in the blue on the outside are the integration, that's where your blockchain, your privacy security, your integration comes in. And what you see at the very bottom there would be where the physical data stand is. That's where MISMO started and really still plays. But look at all the other stuff on top of that. Metadata management, master data management, data orchestration. Basically, this is the whole manipulation. And again, Paul, if you want it, it's in the article. It's a QR code. I see him taking a picture there. Uh, but you kind of look at this is the idea of saying, you know, where does this all come to be? And so when you start talking SMTP, we have the API gateways and protocols. We have a complete AI governance because, again, AI governance is probably almost as equally important as data governance. It's going to be retired and very transitory. You look at the AI services, which are going to be very dynamic. And then you say, oh, how are the applications and all these things going to be using this? That's at the very top of the stack. And one of the things that seems counterintuitive to people at the very bottom are the analytics and the integration or the aggregation platforms. This is where a lot of times people say, I want, I want uh, data-driven analytics. I want data-driven insights. Well, that's the foundation, but you can't get to those foundations without the idea of epics and data catalogs and all this other crazy stuff. And what you see on the, on the far right, and again, you kind of see some uh, uh, descriptors there on the left, but when you look at the far right, the idea of a data fabric, this is a next generation of data virtualization. So when you begin to look at this, how do I begin to integrate all these layers together? And if you can kind of picture the arrows going back and forth, this is the stack. So when something gets retired, guess what? Something else gets replaced. And I can begin to build on this. I can take a master data management catalog or, or, a, or a, a, a data governance type of solution that may satisfy a couple of those. But I can begin to apply them across different texts and different platforms, different silos. I could begin to do this on origination, servicing, securitization, customer contact. It doesn't really matter because now the data is completely compartmentalized and reusable. And so what does that do when we start talking about this? The original idea of standards, we drive costs down. Because this is where the idea of a per loan origination and stuff really come in. I can begin to get that reusability. This idea is, is we've had this. There are piece, there are all these pieces exist within the industry today, financial, mortgage, what have you. They deal in pieces. What we've done is saying rather than integrate them with applications on a vertical standpoint, let's look at them horizontally, integrate them together. And then the applications sit on top of that. So that's really where this idea came to be and, and how we came to say, how does AI use it? Because AI is going to be one of the great big disruptors, whether we think it's hype, uh, whether we think it's gen AI, small AI, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's going to be able to use it. So when you begin to think about things that are semi-intelligent, he'll be back with us. Okay. Rural internet. <laughs> He's got to come back because I got a question. <laughs> I, can, I, gotta, I gotta know. Something. Am I back? Now you're back. Yeah, now you you're back. Ah, we gosh. lost you for a second, Mark. Yeah, yeah. All right, I'm going to jump in so there with a question. I'm going to jump go in with a question. So previously, I was wondering who are going to be the big winners as we move into this new reality, and I see it here in the analytics and aggregation platform. Where does that live? Is that our big cloud providers? Is that going to be some new kind of of on-site uh, quantum computer? What's going to happen seeing, in that bottom layer? Yeah, yeah, you're seeing that today. Amazon's got components. There's Microsoft has components. They're beginning to integrate across the platforms. Even Snowflake uh, has has elements of this. Oracle definitely, especially if you look in the healthcare field uh, with their Cerner acquisition and so forth. So you begin to look at this is that the providers are now saying as long as you standard use standardized AI services, API gateways, we'll provide the glue that brings all this together to give you a 
cross-platform view. I don't care what provider you are. And so it used to be that when you wanted to move your data off Amazon, you wanted to move it off a different provider, that, you know, that was a, a Herculean effort that many people didn't think about. Uh, nowadays, they're saying, okay, don't worry about moving it. Let's integrate it. And so you're seeing this with some of the new AWS products. Uh, you're definitely seeing with Microsoft products. Is that we're getting to glue this stuff together to do cross platforms. We did this on infrastructure that we owned on premise stuff years and years ago, but it was on a much smaller scale. Nowadays, with the ability to make this happen, it's almost like, um, again, this is logical, right? If you look at this physical and how this works, Amazon is set up with what they call the spins and flines, uh, spins and, and kind of uh, splines of how they do this. They do this with their data centers. So their data centers are designed with full cutover and failover. If you look at it, it's like a three-dimensional model that is fully integrated. And you could turn it and look at it and drill into it much of the same way as how they're making this happen. So if you were to put this into a physical, the cloud providers are the best set up because they don't really care where this is. What they're doing is they're providing the tapping. And if you're using common security, using Hyperledger or whatever, using a common fabric, they're kind of from the edges. They're saying, we don't care. You can change this out, but we are now being able to bring this together. So the big providers like AWS. Uh, and some of the other vendors that are coming up through here are, are big. I, I'd be really shocked that you don't see some of the major ones like ICE uh, being able to deal with this. They have the capability. Yeah. Do yeah. they so have that, the vision to execute? Right. So that may not change so much, but the, the apps on the top, now instead of just working within one cloud and right. making sure you get now they don't, they're not limited by that. Cool. And, and it cuts the cost down. It cuts the reusability down. I have one version of the truth. I actually pro can provide that immutable, uh, adaptable type of a data set that, oh, by the way, it's going to change over time. And, and that's the reality of all this is that data is coming fast and furious. We need a better way to do this. And I think that's kind of, you know, going back to the purpose of, of this group, you know, the hyperledger, the, the blockchain. That is probably, if you look at this and you think about the applications, every application that touches the 80 some processes that are within the mortgage industry from customer contact all the way through securitization, you look at all that and it's like, yeah, everybody's doing pieces, parts of this, but they're not doing it consistently. And I think that's where you get into the idea of scalability and adaptability that, uh, you know, we like to talk about. Uh, from a data as a product. So when people start to talk about how do you monetize this, how do you improve it, how do you actually get value from it, that's where this stuff begins to drive. Now, Mark, a uh, quick question, and actually this is a much more depth question than I, I originally thought. Talk about how this logical data architecture is going to be impacted by a recent event. I mean, a couple months ago, there was the Synapse bankruptcy. So that was a fintech, went bankrupt. There was an $85 million shortfall, and it was all due, well, and this is a gross oversimplification, it was due to poor record keeping. This was a company, a fintech, that was essentially banking as a service. So it would take advantage of, of a lot of the innovation and architecture that we're talking about here, but its failure expose a ton of weakness within this logical and data architecture. And, and now people in the fintech world, me included, think that that bankruptcy is going to cause the FDIC and other regulatory bodies to look at something like this very, very closely and potentially slow it down. I don't know if it's going to slow down the adoption of this architecture, if that's what you're referring to. I think it'll actually escalate because if you can get a common version of compliance, you can get real-time compliance monitoring, which is what this has a potential to deliver. This is where I started talking with the heads of audit and tax and, and, and regulatories on the, on the large accounting firms is that I can begin to get a view that is completely event-driven, up-to-date, and oh, by the way, I can track that data back. And, and that's the ability of having and understanding these data stacks, because now I can begin to say, oh, why, why was that transaction missing? Was that because we, it was that a process type of thing or was that a data thing? More than likely, if we would have had access to the data, that type of 
oversight or shortfall or whatever they had of uh, fraud uh, would have been a heck of a lot easier. So when the compliance and the regulators come knocking, that vertical column there feeds down to the analytics and the aggregation platform on a lot of different bases. I can begin to get a common view of that information, regardless of the silos that it's contained in. And that's where the fabric on the right is so critical because I'm protecting on one side and I'm understanding where it is, but I'm integrating all the components in there. And at the very top sits the application. We, we tried this years ago. You think about this. This is kind of like the old purpose of object orientation back in the 70s and the 60s, the separation of the process from the data. We didn't have the tech. We didn't have the mindset. We didn't have the tools to do it. We do today. And with the advent of cloud and all the solutions the last few years, that's been a big deal. That's been the, almost like the catalyst that brought us forward. So none of this is really new thinking. It's put together differently to create a better solution. Very good. Now, Mark, I know these guys are always very cognizant of the time of their members. And so their let's viewers. go to 11, if you yeah. will. Let's go down to 11. Thank you, Rick. This is kind of the call to actions. And these are just some you know, general ones. But again, where is your data stack? Do you understand that you have a data stack? Or is it all buried within? Resil build something that's scalable and resilient. It's adaptable. The common word everybody uses. Automate the quality. Uh, data quality and compliance. This is the ingestion process some people talk about. Uh, and again, in the end, it's like everybody talks about standard data standardization and culture and industry collaborations. That's stuff we've been doing. But now we're going to put it together a little bit different. You see my Where's Waldo thing right there. Uh, in the end, you know, kind of the, the whole idea of Hyperledger is a key role in this. But I don't think it's the, the one size fits all or the you know, one size fits an application mindset that's been there it has a key role in terms of the immutability, security, and the protection of this. Um, so again, that's kind of the call to action, um, but it's something very different uh, than perhaps people have been used to. But I, I, again, um, it's just reapplying things in different ways. So Mark, if I'm understanding you right, you're saying that this technology that these guys have been talking about now for so long may not just be part of individual applications. It may have a larger role to play. Exactly. Right. Yeah, interesting. Again, okay. it's it's like flipping it a little bit. And this is going back, like I said, the theory's been there in academics and, and industry for years. We didn't have the tech to be able to do it. We didn't have the infrastructure that's out there. Cloud, FinTech, RegTech, uh, the databases, the modern data management, all this stuff, security compliance, all this stuff is now coming together. It's almost like a perfect storm. And so now we have the ability to say, oh, if we shift our design principles, our application, go back to model, go back to the ABCs that I talked about, I can begin to leverage what I've already capital invested in. And I can then begin to build applications on top of that that are distinct from my data. I don't have to do a port. I don't have to do an ETL, a warehouse, a lake, all this fun stuff. Right. Now, guys, if you're like me, you're just scratching the surface of the questions you have for a guy like Mark. You can find him wherever smart people gather. He's here often. The next slide. Yeah, you can. Kind yeah, of yeah. See. Go to the next. Yeah, yeah, there you go. There you go. Keep that conversation going. And now, James and Marvin, I'll get out of your way and let you finish up. Awesome. Thanks for having uh, us. Mark, uh, Rick, thank you very much. That was a fantastic discussion. I know I have a, a ton of questions, and <laughs> if I had my brothers, I, we would be on this call for at least another hour. But <laughs> I want to be respectful of people's time and, and, and say thank you to the people that did attend. Uh, we will share a recording of this, and, and this is going to be, I think, one of those meetings where we get a ton of questions, we get a ton of views. Uh, I expect people to be drilling down on this and, and taking a look at what you had to say. Mark and Rick, and then contacting you. So thank you for sharing your contact information. With that said, I want to be respectful of people's time and say thank you to everyone. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Rick. Um, and thank you for our attendees. And I think yeah. that's it, unless there are any questions or last minute comments. No, I just really appreciate uh, the time here. And there is a lot to digest. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, no, this is a. 
Great presentation. Mark Rick, it's always great having you on the show. I know I wrote down some additional <laughs> questions. I was hoping to get popped out as well, um, but we can circle back on those. But yeah, thank you guys again for joining us and presenting just some fabulous information. And, you know, as Marvin said, this will be posted up to our wiki site as well as uh, YouTube channel as well. Yep. Thanks. Hey, thanks, everyone. Thank Take you. Care. Have a good day. You too. Take care, everyone.